Are we are now recording. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, being here today. Welcome at our um, event conversations with strategy featuring today Dr. Neil Melvin on research and think tanks. Um, my name is Eleonora Natale. I'm a lecturer in international history at the Department of War Studies. And before introducing our guest today, um, let me spend a couple of uh, words on our event series. Um, Conversations with Strategy is a monthly appointment uh, that offers students at work studying the opportunity to meet and um, ask our visiting fellows um, about their research and career paths, uh, from former diplomats to intelligence analysts, journalists, civil servants, and policymakers. Uh, our visiting fellows will discuss their career journey and they will provide tips and advice on their uh, chosen profession. They will discuss the lessons they've learned and offer insights into contemporary uh, strategic challenges. The discussion today will be followed by a Q&A and conversation with students. So for all those of you who have uh, joined online today, please use the chat function on Zoom. I will monitor it and uh, let you in the conversation. Um, the event is recorded, so it will be available um, online in our uh, website. And now let me introduce our guest. Uh, here with me we have uh, my colleague, Dr. Natasha Perth. Uh, she's a lecturer in international um, peace and security. She's an expert in uh, Russian security matters and international law. And this is our special guest and visiting fellow, Dr. Neil Melvin. Um, Neil is Director of International Security Studies at RUSIM, the Royal United Services Institute. Um, his current research focuses on emerging international security dynamics in key regions like Europe and Eurasia, the Gulf and uh, Middle East, East Africa and the Horn, and in the Pacific. His recent publications have focused on the new external security politics of the Horn of Africa and Indian Ocean and the Black Sea region. Prior to joining Ruzi, Neil was director of the Armed Conflict and Conflict Management Program, and then director of research at the Stockholm um, International Peace Research Institute. He held senior advisor positions in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Energy Charter, the European Union, and he has been a consultant for the United Nations. Neil has also held positions at the Center for European Policy Studies and Chatham House, as well as several universities. He also had DPhil from Oxford University. He has been visiting fellow at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University and the Department of Government at LSE. So thank you so much for being with us today. And I leave you the uh, floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eleonora. Um, hi, Neil. Um, really good to see you in person. Um, really great to also meet Eleonora in person. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, obviously, you're working in the think tank world now, but as we just heard from your biography, um, you know, you've actually had a really incredibly varied career. And when I first met you back in the 1990s, I can't remember quite which year, but in the mid-1990s possibly, you were still in academia. I think you were then working on your postdoc at LSE, and it was very much focused on Russia, um, the Russian diaspora, Russian regions. Um, and so um, obviously you've then moved away from that world, but um, how, if you like, you know, was there a particular reason for you to move from academe into the think tank world or did it just sort of happen or, you know, tell, tell us something a bit about how that process actually mm -hmm. worked? No, thanks, and it's a delight to be here, and it's great to be visiting fellow kings. It's really a, a privilege. But in response to your question, um, I think it's a combination of uh, well, strategic issues in line, I think, with the theme of this, but also personal, you know, personal development things happen in your life. So I very much started out in academia, and my main interests were Russia, post-Soviet space. Um, but I got interested in very contemporary issues as the Soviet Union fell apart, in particular, this issue around uh, stranded minorities, as they were known, sort of, uh, minority communities who suddenly found themselves outside their home states. 
And in particular, I was looking at uh, the issue of the Russians. Uh, we only seen in the early 90s uh, what had happened with the former Yugoslavia. And then, of course, there was a concern that something similar might happen with Russia at that point because they were uh, uh, calculated up to 25 million ethnic Russians or larger linguistic communities, big questions about national minorities, particularly in the Baltic states, Estonia and Latvia. And Latvia, there was a place even becoming a majority community there, large parts of Kazakhstan, Ukraine, of course. So I, was, I spent a lot of time working on those issues initially at, um, at Chatham House. I became involved in uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which was set up uh, or transitioned from being the Helsinki process to being well, the CSE and then the OSCE around that time. And one of the mandates in there was to deal with uh, national minority questions where they risk becoming an issue of interstate security. Mm -hmm. And there was a dedicated mechanism, still is the High Commission on National Minorities. So I started consulting. For the High Commissioner, the first one, Max van der Stoel, former Dutch Foreign Minister, a very distinguished uh, person, and very active in precisely these areas of conflict prevention, trying to develop uh, solutions to majority minority problems, uh, focus, but focus on a security agenda. So it wasn't human rights were important, but of course they were structured around the security issues that we were focusing on. And really, at that point, I transitioned from being an academic. I was teaching at the University of Leeds, uh, Russian conservative issues, very much in your area. Uh, and I moved to work in this mechanism for five years, where we were doing a lot on uh, Baltic states, Moldova, Crimea issue. We, we helped negotiate the first autonomy status on, on Crimea, which until the Russians annexed it in 2014 was the basis for, for managing sort of federal ethnic relations around Crimea. Lot of work in Central Asia around uh, similar issues to the Uzbek minority, which uh, had a mm -hmm. kind of dispersing across uh, the neighborhood in southern Kazakhstan, southern Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. Uh, very interesting work in Turkmenistan, where we had uh, a very closed society and uh, still very similar issues. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of, I think, the, the point I moved from being an academic full time into other areas. Uh, and then the personal part is while I was working for the OSC, I met my wife, who's um, a Swedish diplomat. And then, of course, you have to look to, to combine two yeah. careers. And we chose, I think, the path that um, we would really try and follow her career in terms of, of moving. Mm -hmm. um, and I would then uh, have more flexibility and pick up some opportunities around that. So, uh, and this is where I think I've, I've moved from working in policy community uh, in Brussels, quite a lot of work on with the energy charter, which is similar to the OEC, but on energy security, European energy security. Uh, Horn of Africa, where I retooled a bit, uh, looking at um, uh, well, growth, some growing geopolitics around that. And, and so that, that I think becomes an issue, you know, how then you have two careers and, and children along the way. Yeah. Uh, and I thought actually that up until recently, years, my CV was going in a lot of different and contradictory directions, mm. because I'd worked on, on Soviet space, on, uh, not on, on Middle East issues, that led the US-Iran dialogue around KCPO for some years, um, and then the uh, Horn of Africa, and then suddenly, of course, the job at Rusi came up, which was international security, which mm. actually brought all these mm. different things together, so there was a, there was a certain serendipity, I think. Yeah. You know, suddenly your career, which was, was made for rather personal issues, sometimes jobs appear that bring it together, or perhaps you, you followed your in particular interests, yes. and that was the way the world was going, as it, as it turned yeah. out. Yeah, that's interesting as, as well, if you, if we think back over the kind of, I don't know, long durée, if you like, of your career, in the sense mm -hmm. that, you know, you began with looking at the Russian diaspora and so on, the Russian regions, and I imagine there was then a point, perhaps in the late 1990s and early 2000s, where these issues didn't seem, but well, seemed to really fade somehow in significance and importance. I mean, you're talking about are you uh, this issue of autonomy for Crimea um, in the 1990s and so on, you know. And um, so, were you, if you like, surprised, or you know, how did, you know when these issues, in a way? Resurfaced, I guess, mm. um, you know, not too long ago, vis-a-vis uh, Crimea, but also in other areas, and then 
that whole idea of you know the whiskey near mm. the sound it's kind of soft power project i mean how you know and you were maybe working on other areas then at that point so how did you kind of you know did you think were you surprised or did you have you kind of seen some kind of pattern emerging yeah i mean i don't think i saw I mean, you're surprised by the timing, perhaps. Yeah. But, I mean, the fault lines of these issues mm-hmm. were laid down with the breakup sure. of the Soviet Union uh, and the subsequent failure of the wider European security project. I mean, which, as you say, in the late 1990s, yeah. and that became clear yeah. that uh, on the Western side, there was an enlargement or expansion agenda, uh, which was, uh, you know, I worked in the mechanisms that were developed to span the East West divisions, yeah. both. On the security side with OCE, but also the energy charter. And so I saw it in both those areas that there was uh, a push uh, as the EU and NATO enlarged to uh, minimize those organizations. And, yeah. and of course, the Russians felt that. Uh, and uh, they, uh, in, for example, I think when uh, Baltic states joined the EU, the national minority issue. Was no longer accepted by the EU to be dealt with in the OSC framework. I mean, mm-hmm. We struggled to make sure that the national, the High Commission of National Minority still had a role, but essentially it took it away from the OSC to a large degree. And of course, for the Russians, that was a, a key issue. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they began to also to lose interest in those mechanisms and, mm-hmm. and, and they turned to other, other issues. So, of course, then it became uh, fault lines that we had uh, worked on in the 1990s. Everyone knew what they were, and they haven't gone away. I mean, mm-hmm. Transnistria is unresolved. Yeah. Uh, you know, over two and a half, two yeah, and a half decades later, three decades later, yeah. uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, mm-hmm. uh, Crimea from the beginning. I mean, let's say yeah. I worked on that as a, an autonomy issue in 1995, 96, I think mm-hmm. it was. Uh, and we saw already what the issues were there. Yes. Um, Donbass, the same thing, I mean, the whole language yeah. issues. So, yeah, I mean, these, these were the questions I think that, that were there, and we had, we had a trans, what we thought was a transitional mechanism. But once those broke down, of course, we've seen them come out yeah. in full force, and, they, and uh, this is now reality of the security questions. Um, yes, I mean, it's interesting to look back, and I mean, I remember as well, you know, that there was that sense in, in Russia that, you know, the CSC and then later OSC was going was actually going to become this kind of pan-European security mm-hmm. architecture, if you like. And so I mean, how much to what extent, and you're obviously talking about all these issues that you know essentially have um, kind of come back to um, to haunt us mm-hmm. um, in multiple ways. Um, and as you say, connecting back to Yugoslavia, perhaps of Yugoslavia as well, there were a lot of parallels there. Um, so do you feel that um, there was a way in which um, had that European security architecture remained in place or been, if you like, um, you know, institutionalized somewhat differently? As you say, there were various um, ways in which um, it, it came to play a different mm-hmm. role or a less significant role. Do you think that we have sort of perhaps not have not be facing some of the issues that we're facing mm. today, had that um, organization, if you like, um, kind of, you know, had that security architecture actually really, you know, been instituted in the way that people, some people, including mm. some people in Russia, felt that it should have been. I mean, I think it was very difficult. I mean, looking back on it, it was probably very difficult I mean, to find a solution because. Mm. I mean, the legacy of the Cold War was that there was a big power imbalance. I mean, mm. That was the reality. And of course, once uh, the Russians thought we were going to have a Vancouver to Vladivostok um, yeah. security architecture, in which they would be a leading voice yes. as a great power in that. Mm. Um, and of course, they were, I think they were willing to, to accept some aspects of the human rights, the mobilization agenda around that. Mm. But uh, you know, from the Western side, of course, we weren't willing to let NATO be subsumed to that. And so once we got yeah. to that point, it was very difficult to find a way forward. Plus, you had, of course, many countries who had been part of the Soviet uh, bloc and saw this as an opportunity to escape. I mean, obviously, they had been repressed and uh, 
occupied uh, mm -hmm. the feeling and uh, so this was a chance for them to break free and I, I think they sort of thought that was the opportunity and, and so there was that coincidence of interest so yes I think it was you know the, and the Russians uh, gradually through the 90s you could see that they they were feeling this power imbalances that their expectations didn't match yeah. on the other hand their country was in a very bad shape uh, disorganized possibly on the verge of breakup itself on these regionalism issues uh, Des desperate war in yeah. Chechnya, you know, a feeling that uh, loose nukes. So it was sort of, I think that that relationship became very difficult. And then Putin came into that mix and, of course, began to change it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, now, of course, what we see is, I think we're beginning to see this, is that European security as a concept itself is now being contested. Yeah. You know, European security was forged in my view anyway, in, in the sort of Cold War environment when Europe was the center of global geopolitics. Once Russia stepped away from that project, that was the first step. Now we've seen other steps and uh, the European security is in transformation and shrinking. Mm -hmm. Enlargement seems to be dead now, despite the ambition. We've seen that in the Western Balkans, just need to clear that they're not going to join, yeah. perhaps ever. Turkey, uh, UK has now left the EU, uh, so there's a, big, yes. a movement now in which, and of course also what we've seen is that European security is being defined by a debate about Indo-Pacific. I was just about to turn. So I mean yeah. the, the, you know, the parameters of what European security is, I think, is, is shifting very fast. Yes. I mean, the Russi is now just creating a European security program. Partly to examine, uh, and I'm going to try and lead a bit on the UK thinking post yeah. Brexit, but also because looking ahead, it's very hard to see what European security may look like in yeah. 10 years. I mean, it's yeah. not may not be NATO in the EU. We don't know exactly <laughs> what you know, what yes. the parameters are. I mean, that's a bit radical thinking, that, but I mean, you can see that yeah. uh, there's a lot of uh, movement, uh, a lot of uh, coalitions of the willing mm. emerging outside. Two pillars yes. of European security. Uh, the OSCE is, is probably on its last legs, um, still going on in some areas, mm -hmm. but I think really pressed back. And so that's that's a question now to me. I think about yeah. what this all looks like. That's really interesting. Um, I think also, you know, one in in some ways you could, I suppose, argue that European security was for a long time, in a way, defined vis-à-vis -vis Soviet Union. I mean, you know, it was obviously that's another question whether it was actually part of Europe. I mean, and obviously had the bifurcation of Western and Eastern Europe, but, you know, then this idea of a kind of larger Europe and then the whole question of whether Russia became part of that and actually Turkey as well, as you say. Mm -hmm. and of course, Russia is now, you know, has its idea of a kind of greater Eurasia, which is supposed to be a kind of condominium of, you know, the Eurasian Economic Union mm -hmm. within Russia and the former parts of the former Soviet space in tandem with the Belt and Road Initiative, although mm. I don't think that China actually ever talks about Greater Eurasia. The Greater Eurasian Partnership is a kind of little bit of a, mm. a fantasy, I think, perhaps, that Russia indulges in. But, but in a way, you know, we're all having to define ourselves much more now in relation to China and the rise mm. of China. Um, and so that does leave that whole European project in something of a, I don't know what the word is, limbo or quandary. Yeah. Um, and as you say, obviously, um, the whole idea of this tilt to the Indo-Pacific, um, you know, which obviously has been also rolled out in our, in our own integrated review. Um, but, but actually, you know, it has raised so many questions um, in so many countries um, about, you know, where Europe is going. Mm. Um, no, I think it's. I mean, it's a very, it's a very interesting time to work on international security. It's very, it's a very difficult time. It's also quite worrying. I think. I mean, in my lifetime, mm -hmm. of, you know, obviously, there's a lot of optimism, idealism. You could say at you know, the end yeah. of the Cold War. I think we're entering a much more worrying period now. Yeah. Many more actors. Uh, you know, we talked about unipolar world ending. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we're there yet, but you know, as you said. Russia has now broken out of the post-Soviet space. We've seen that since 2014, the annexation of Crimea, mm -hmm. the presence in Syria, military base in Syria. Yeah. Um, 
obviously setting up military base in Sudan, playing a bigger role in the East Mediterranean, but it's not just the Russians. I mean, uh, yeah. Turkey is now pursuing in many ways yes. independent on the security policy, although it's still a member of NATO. Gulf actors are becoming much more important. Mm -hmm. and I saw that in the Horn of Africa, where I was based mm -hmm. before I joined Lucy, is that Qatar, uh, UAE, Saudi are big investors, but also looking to play a larger role mm. in historical areas as they view it, you know, which yes. is Swahili coast. And, uh, and also you see Japan, China, South mm. Korea with military presence in the whole of Africa, you know, the entrance to the Red Sea. Mm. So these areas, I think, that we saw as in southern, the southern flank of Europe are no longer just that. There's many other people. And you know, this is the definition of European security, I think, is being push you know, East Mediterranean mm. now, it's no longer just a European space. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen that even this, you know, this recent deal between France and Greece yeah. uh, on uh, around uh, ships, but with extra security guarantees beyond the EU yeah. and beyond NATO, and obviously focused on a NATO member, Turkey. Yeah. So I mean, this, is, this is a very different world mm. from even 10 years ago, I would say. Um, and so this is for the UK, how we navigate that uh, is a challenge. There's some, I mean, there may be some advantages, of course, from being outside the EU because mm. there is a flexibility and a fluidity and uh, having some successes. You know, perhaps the AUKUS deal, uh, the UK has become a, uh, an observer to the ASEAN very quickly uh, and yes. uh, trade issues and so on. But, yeah. What now is the balance and priorities between these traditional European questions and the Russia question fundamentally? Yeah. And these other ones, this is, I think, uh, going to be an issue yeah. we have to work through. And others are struggling too. Yeah. I mean, you know, when the integrated review came out, there were a lot of people saying, well, it's all very well to talk about tilting to the Indo Pacific, but shouldn't we really, you know, shouldn't the heart of our mm. sort of security strategy really be Europe? Mm. And particularly now, you know, defending against Russia. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, that, that's the language in it. And of course, there's a lot of critical boosterism around global Britain. But I think you can begin to see the skeleton of a UK approach, which is uh, a much firmer focus on the flanks. So Northern, Northern Europe, uh, yeah. the Mediterranean, a, a much stronger maritime. Mm. Uh, engagement around these things like this joint expedition forces, CGF, and hanging off relations with other European countries around those frameworks, which again go beyond NATO and now yes. outside the EU. So in the northern northern Europe, the UK is working with, uh, with Sweden and Finland very closely mm -hmm. now to non-NATO members in, in a mechanism that's, that's UK defined. So yeah you know, even though Europe is the core and NATO is very clearly identified in integrated review as the focus, the UK, I think, is also doing not unlike what France has done with yeah. Greece. It's, this is the, the way things are going. And of course, countries are looking to how they can secure yeah. their security when uh, they're not sure where the US is going. Yeah. Uh, the EU has big ambitions, but it's not supposed to seemingly able to deliver on security and defense. We'll see mm -hmm. next year that that actually pans out. Uh, and this, I think, in the current reality is these ad hoc informal coalitions of states. Um, so Brexit, I think, not the focus on Brexit, but I think Brexit may be histor historically, and I have a story in here from the panel, when you look back on these things, I wonder whether Brexit will be seen to be part of a larger movement yeah. that's beginning to happen. And that you know these these bigger shifts in international security around the rise in the Indo Pacific, mm -hmm. the economic shift of interest back towards Asia historically, and uh, the pivot by the US. You know, these are all factors that made Europe the core of global mm -hmm. security. They all move now. Yeah. And I think these are the kind of tectonic forces that may be beginning to move around our, our understanding of what security even means in the European space. Yeah, sure. I mean, that puts me in mind of, um, with Amitabh Acharya talked about a multiplex world, 
you know, not multipolar, multiplex, mm. you know, a bit like going to a multiplex cinema, you mm. can kind of choose what screen to what, you know, to watch, yeah. if you like. Um, you know, there could be 20 different screens to watch all these different uh, films on. And, and the idea that, you know, essentially, you know, we don't really, okay, we've obviously got NATO, but I mean, essentially, you know, we don't have these kind of durable set in stone yeah. alliances, you know, that, that they are these kind of shifting alignments and they are maybe more like alignments rather than alliances. Yeah. yeah. And you want to be in the crowd that's going to the IMAX 3D. Exactly. So that's, that's the challenge yeah. for everybody. Not, not the 2D. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, and it's, it's, this is, I think, a very interesting moment. Um, but of course, we also want to preserve I mean, what was important on the, in the solidarity and the close ties, uh, which was the core and, and is the core of European relations. So, um, I mean, the EU obviously will, is a very important uh, actor and it's got a big ambition. So that's another dimension to the UK, I think, to look at. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very difficult at the moment, but uh, what, we've, what we're not sure is what this all looks like going forward. I mean, there's lots of status quo um, mm -hmm. momentum, but I think we need to do a bit more strategic thinking uh, about what the vision is. So it's, it's, it can't be anymore, I think, the Paris Charter idea of the no. Europe whole uh, and so on, because uh, things have moved beyond that. Yeah. And that, I think, was, I mean, again, coming back to the UK, it's been interesting because the integrated review, perhaps one of the first European countries to really start to think about it, the French, of course, will be doing as well. But it's not, I mean, I think it, for me, an interesting point in that was it's not just about defending the rules-based order, which became a bit of a mantra, which is a very reactive yeah. status quo position. The first time they said the UK has to start to move on to the front foot and be more assertive, uh, look to deter more, uh, be unpredictable. And so you see that in, in relation to Russia, I mean, the UK has, yeah. in a way, although we're focusing on the tilt in the Pacific, the UK has pivoted against Russia very clearly in, in the North and in the Black Sea. Yeah. And it's leading, I think, and we saw this with this uh, British frigate defender, which yes. sailed through uh, uh, Ukrainian territorial waters, waters around the ground occupied Crimea. And uh, that was, I think, for perhaps the first time there's been such an explicit pushback yes. uh, to what's been going on in the last 10 years. Now, this is why I say there's the danger now, because we now have both sides be beginning to move uh, on Returning to a more deterrence based, active deterrence based yeah. concepts uh, with all the risks around escalation and misunderstanding that can come from that. Yes. I mean, I don't think we're going to see a scenario playing out like the final scene of James Bond, but um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's well, a bit of a kind of strange uh, incident that plays out there. They, they seem to bomb one of the courier lines. Yes, exactly. Where <laughs> Well, spoiler alert, if you yeah. haven't seen the film, yeah. but, you know, um, I think as my son said, this is a last ditch attempt for Britain to reclaim its status as a global power. <laughs> oh, yeah. In some ways it also reflects, I think, I mean, you can see that is it's a kind of, it's also a synergy of the evolution of the Bond thing, because it ends with a very old style yeah. baddie inside a, a sort of giant base. But also <laughs> there is this geopolitically contested island with yes. Russia and Japan and the UK sort of in the mix. So I think this, I mean, there's a certain, yeah. uh, there's a certain mm. relevance to where we are in terms of our own transition. Yes, perhaps. I think mm. maybe they've been reading the integrated mm. Yeah, obviously we need yeah. And the Russi website, of course. Of course, <laughs> sorry, the Russi website. <laughs> um, so just, I mean, I'm not sure how we're doing for time. But yeah, but, yes, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, how, is it about two years you've been at RUC now? Yeah, so I started just before the lockdown. Yes. And, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, again, it's an interesting time because Brexit was just about to happen after a long period. Yeah. Of, uh, I think UK policy was not sort of, well, in fact, let's focus on Brexit. You now it started something else. Then, of course, you were, like everyone went to working online. Yes. Which, from a think tank perspective, I think has been quite an interesting and, and some it's difficult in some ways, but also it's it's forced us to rethink what we did. Yeah. Because Rusi, uh, as many people know, is 
It's linked to this historic building uh, in Whitehall, obviously the Foreign Office, mm. which was started by the Duke of Wellington in the 1830s and, and others to look at military science. Um, and I think, you know, suddenly going online, we've had to think who is our audience? How yeah. do we engage with the audience? Uh, is this an opportunity to also have a much more diverse discussion yeah. around security, not just a, a sort of a, a white hole focused, London focused yeah. conversation or a UK focused conversation? Yeah. Because suddenly you can have events online where you can reach out yeah. all over the world. Of course, my team, which is the international team, international security team. To be able to actually engage directly in India, South Korea, Africa, Middle East without having to travel there, yes. but also to reach audiences, right? yeah. again, outside their capitals, yes. has been a very interesting way to think about how you do that and how think tanks should work Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in this, this time where before we used to have a very clear model of traveling to events where experts and officials would show up. Uh, in quite closed rooms, but perhaps yeah. there's a chance to also democratize a bit the, the discussion yeah. around around security and bringing communities who perhaps not felt that you receive is their institution or these conversations yeah. about them. Yeah. So that, that's been, I think, a very liberating part of COVID. You know, mm -hmm. in the of tragedy for us to rethink some of those issues. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you know, in academia, it's been a similar. Mm -hmm. uh, thing you know, I mean, obviously now we can go back to in-person conferences, for example. But certainly for young researchers, there have been some benefits, mm -hmm. if you like, to the online experience. And but also, as you say, that you you can build a much more diverse audience, mm -hmm. but also more diverse panels. I mean, I certainly know that some of the panels I attended at RUSI um, in the past year, you know, for example, you had the one on the Russian Far East, and then you're able to bring in mm. people actually from the Russian exactly. Paris, which you wouldn't normally obviously go able to do. No, and I think, I mean, this is a, for my team, again, this is something very important, is that we can actually bring the conversations taking place around the world you know, into the London scene. Yeah. So that we don't, you know, obviously there's this bit of a bubble sometimes in the transatlantic community where we're all telling ourselves how great we are <laughs> and, and so on, uh, and it might not, well, it's important to engage with others, uh, partly to well, have a discussion about how you're perceived, but also to have, you know, have these conversations. And so it's also been interesting, I think, uh, on in what's happened a lot since Brexit is a really strong desire to engage with the UK on, uh, on dialogues about mm -hmm. uh, how to, to have a relationship with the post-Brexit UK. And so it's in a big demand from Japan, Australia, India, Mm -hmm. And again, I think this, you know, moving online has actually made those conversations easier because yeah. you can have them more regularly and it's, it's easier than to travel with long distances. So it's actually been quite a useful way uh, for us to sort of hear also how the UK is perceived uh, yeah. in different right. parts of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So good, good reality check sometimes, but <laughs> some of the conversations in London. Yes, right. So, um, so how do you feel that uh, RUSI has then, has it enlarged its membership or, I mean, has it attracted younger people to RUSI, do you think, by virtue of being able to be online? Well, I think that's been, it's been an opportunity, yeah. I mean, because if you've been to RUSI events, I think it's, uh, we have, a, I think, a pretty diverse workforce now. That's been a big yeah. success, is that we've brought in, uh, you know, uh, a range of uh, and sort of people with expertise uh, on gender, so gender balance, I think we've made progress there. Um, we now have a clear commitment to have, have balance, some gender balance on all our panels, for example, as mm -hmm. a policy group of Lucy, to, so we don't end up with uh, lots of men. Um, of course, our traditional constituency has been the Ministry of Defence, so we also yes. have a you know, we started a discussion, I think, about how security can be also diversified in terms of our audience, mm -hmm. because obviously those are sometimes our events were not very diverse in terms of the audience. So that, that's a big issue. We can't really necessarily alter that, but I think we can promote a wider interest yeah. in this. And so online events, we can target more young people, different ethnic communities, people outside London, 
Yeah. Um, and that is a, a big chance. And also, I think, uh, as I mentioned, to bring in, you know, we had a very good event, I think, where we uh, brought in people from Iran, experts, mm -hmm. to talk about how Iran viewed yeah. the JCPOA. Yeah. Of course, you yeah. may not agree with them, we often don't. But to, just to hear the perspective and to hear why, not the view, but also yeah. what is the reason. Yes. I think we don't often get that. We may get the headline views, but to understand why countries have particular security positions yeah. uh, is, is very important. We, we, you know, then you know why, what it is that's underlying this. And uh, yeah, most countries, they have a reason for, for what, where they are. It's not just that they mm -hmm. are. Uh, values clash or something, something else going on. Yeah. So now we've just started a European security program again to try and keep these conversations with our European neighbours also active. Yes. Uh, I think it's a very dynamic time. So uh, that's separate from international security. No, that's, 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 that's a new program. program. It's a new regional program yeah. we're launching on actually 14th of this month yes. um, to uh, reach out on European security. Yeah. I think we have three goals. One is to try and understand some of these changes we spoke about at the beginning. Two, to um, engage with uh, European partners and what they're thinking. And third, of course, is to say, where does the UK, how does it go forward now yeah. on these issues? Um, so we have, we have an Indo Pacific program, Russia and Eurasia, MENA, Africa, and Europe. Yes. Covering, which is quite a new thing, and it reflects the yeah. recent very thematic in the past. Now we're having a lot of more a more yeah. geographical regional yes. security focus. Although even that is, is, is becoming more complicated because I think many of these Europe, even these security regions were defined around a Western centric world. Yes. So you know, so you can see the Middle East and parts of the Horn of Africa. Yeah. are interacting in a, in a new way, which isn't just African security and, and yeah. men. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, and so we, we, yeah, as these things change, I think we may have to even reclassify some of, yeah. these, some of these security spaces. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's very interesting. And I think, you know, for example, you know, when you look at, um, say, the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, in a way, that's not really about regions. Mm -hmm. No. It's just um, a sort of global idea. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you say, I mean, I mean, these regions in many places are, you know, they're quite the kind of borders of these regions, if you like, even if you're just thinking mm. about it, um, you know, it, the kind of imaginary, if you like, kind of geopolitical imaginary mm. of that space. I mean, you know, they're, they're all kind of seeping into each other and overlapping in there. Because you say that's happening much, much more. Yeah. I mean, um, and those borders are often the contested ones. You know, we see that in is it Asia, is it Eurasia, or is it uh, European security, or is it yes. Euro Eurasia? Yeah. Uh, say Gulf, Gulf uh, Africa. If you go to talk to the foreign ministry in India, of course, that's West Asia. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, so it depends where you sit. It depends how you view yeah. these and the linkages, I think. And you know, as, yes. as Asia rises, of course, those linkages will. Reshape, they're already reshaping. Yes, yeah. So it's a very exciting mm. time, really, to be yeah. doing what you're doing. No, I think, I mean, uh, so perhaps you know, the audience, I mean, if you're a student now, of course, it's, I mean, my advice, I think, is also what we're going to need is people who know these regions, speak yeah. the languages, know the history, and understand. Yeah. We've perhaps moved away from that often. It's just funny to hear you <laughs> saying that, you know, because yeah. me, you perhaps as well coming from an area studies background you know we were kind of being yeah. tossed out with the garbage at, you know when the soviet union collapsed and so on and sort of you know we don't need area studies people anymore and, mm. you know and there was that kind of big swing away from all of that yeah. and it feels like now the pendulum sort of swinging back a yeah. little bit yeah, i mean my, my team i can see that is i mean uh, it's a very diverse team and yeah. it's uh, and it's people who speak farsi or you know, Mandarin or, yeah. or Hindi, whatever it is, we need to ask the kind of expertise that you need to start with. Yes. And then, of course, it's very important to build up your sort of analytical and international relations and politics point of view. But 
I mean, that's partly maybe why also I moved a little bit away from academia is because you could see that in the 90s, there was a strong push on uh, comparative politics and decoupled from yeah. cultures and histories and languages. Uh, I mean, there's a merit of us to that kind of approach, uh, but I think we, we're seeing now that perhaps we may have gone a little bit too far yes. in my yeah. sense on some of these uh, Formal methodologies, maybe, to it's, uh, doesn't really help you understand what's sometimes really happening. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> Great, this was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Neil and Natasha, for such a rich uh, conversation. Let's see if we have uh, questions from the public. So, for those of you who are online, please uh, leave your comments and questions in the chat, and I will uh, read them. Otherwise, do we have questions from <laughs> public here? Yes. Thank you, um, take it. Thank you so much um, for the conversation. Um, I have a question regarding the career. Um, as um, MA student in your studies, um, aspiring to have a job research position in think tank, um, what do you advise us to do in order to get a position in mm. think tank? Is it uh, like trying to uh, build, like build, uh, like a portfolio, like writing as much as writing or mm. uh, connections? Or... Yeah, I mean, I, if I reflect on, on my time, uh, the big changes I've seen from when I started out is it's become much more competitive in the think tank. There's many more think tanks, so, so it's, it, there is a career track there, but the competition has grown enormously. Um, Issues around fundraising have become very important. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot more focus on creativity. So it used to be that, of course, people would be expected to write a, write a lot longer books. And now that's not really the case. People want very snappy things, uh, data, visualization. So I think that there's a set of skills beyond writing now about how thinking about things. But I would also say that I think having experience, you know, in my area anyway, experience in other countries or on the issues working in government or the NGO sector, or, because I think going straight from an academic background into think tanks, that there's probably less of that because people, you know, you need to know how governments work, how policy is made, because what, what ultimately think tanks are about is impact. It's not writing a, a great report that no one's going to read. You need to you, know, you need to have the creativity, the ideas, but also know how that can feed into policy making processes. Uh, so I think it's uh, you need you need quite a range of skills and a range of experiences. And you know, my career, in a way, I, I sort of can see a bit of things that you can do. You, you probably won't sit in a think tank for your whole life either. It won't be a thirty year career. You might go in for a few years and then on the basis of that go into some other area get some experience that area and then come back to a think tank for a chance to think about that and try and impact so i think it's it's not a it's not a, a job for life in a sense i think for very few people i can imagine it's going to be much more about moving between different areas now of course there's areas of career there but it's not going to be very predictable necessarily um, perhaps that's true for many things now. So I think it would be, you know, once you finish your master's degree, uh, if you can get another opportunity to work in an international organization uh, or, or an organization working on your issue of interest, then I think it's easy to come back into think tanks from that. Thank you. We have a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, someone is asking here, bearing in mind the more complicated geographical sense of security, would you recommend that undergraduate and master's students specialize around the particular themes, for example, cybersecurity, rather than a particular region? Is there a possibility to combine both, perhaps? I mean, I think you, you, you can. I mean, and obviously, some of the strongest people will have a range of those skills. At RUSI, we're organized into different, mostly thematic teams. So, for example, we have a cyber team, which is extremely busy at the moment, because obviously this has become a, a, a 
huge issue and, and the UK is discussing uh, whether it is a cyber power and what that means. So there's a big debate in government, I think, about this, and you, and you may have seen in the news, there's an uh, establishment of a new national cyber center that explicitly will be involved in offensive cyber. Uh, but then we're also, I mean, that, that team is also working with my team on how the UK can work with other countries mm. and what the capacity building issues and how that can also translate into positive with UK relationships with friends and allies, but also other partners. So, you know, I think if you've got, if you've got the knowledge about other countries, but also a, a strong thematic focus, that is probably the best combination um, because then you can work on, on these issues in different ways. And so, I mean, obviously there's a lot of emerging security issues, you know, cyber and uh, uh, all issues really are in, 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 uh, in movement now. And indeed, of course, another big change from when I started is that the concept of security has become so huge. Mm -hmm. It used to be about state-to-state -state conflicts. It's practically coming back to that. But, you know, obviously we have teams working on wildlife trafficking and uh, traditional military science areas, terrorism, conflict, de-radicalization, mm -hmm. uh, criminal justice issues, migration. So I mean, all this is now under the, the security rubric in a way it never what used to be. And mm -hmm. look at Chatham House, they have health yes. issues, uh, at which perhaps today is understanding even more understandable, but you know, the concept of security is expanded. So I think also you have to think how what is your, your approach to the issue? Is it a security aspect framing? climate change. Yeah, I mean, some people have been critical of that, of course, mm. they? you know, is it Edward Newman and others, of course, you know, who yeah. talked about, you know, the dangers of, yeah. you know, making everything about security. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, I mean, it becomes difficult to prioritise. Yes, course. exactly. Uh, and so we, perhaps we, when we reflect on what happened during COVID, I mean, obviously, COVID or, or pandemic preparedness was a UK priority. And I remember people rather proudly talking about how the UK had one of the best preparedness in, in the world ahead of this. But of course, as it turns out, it was a priority, but not the top priority. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, this is, I think, one of, one of the risks now is that everything is securitized. And yeah. so everything is important at the same time. And then it becomes very difficult to have these discussions yeah. about where your resources go. Yes. I mean, there is a danger that you pull yourself too, too broad. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, and there was an interesting discussion a few years ago whether we shouldn't even have a discussion about threats, but we should have a discussion about flexibility in governments to be able to respond to a crisis. Because you couldn't, you can't really predict what is going to be the threat. Yeah. What's going to be most important is your ability to respond quickly to that and yeah. reorganize and sort of bounce back, if you like. Yes. But this idea that there is a defined set of things that you're ready for, almost inevitably, you, that things that come along will not be on that list. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there's some merit to that as well in, in, this, yes. in this world of everything being securitized. I mean, I think we've seen that as well with the UN Security Council. Yeah. You know, the number of things that are defined as a threat to international peace and security. Yeah. You know, which is all very well, but then you know, what are you going to do about exactly. it? You know, they see that with, I mean, with mandates for peace operations. I mean, they become exactly. so huge. That Everything is you can't really seven. do anything. Yeah, uh, peace operations, doing cyber security, intelligence. Yeah, you know, against organized crime, doing traditional peace mm -hmm. building, working on gender issues and human rights and post conflict <laughs> justice. <laughs> And so then trying to solve the conflict, or then yeah. of course it becomes a big shopping list where yes. it's very hard to you know, perhaps deal with, with, with conflicts. And, mm -hmm. uh, so perhaps we, see, yeah, we may have seen peak comprehensive security. Yeah. I mean, you can't disagree with comprehensive security, but practically it becomes very hard to deliver it in a meaningful way, I think. Yeah. Thank so, you. Um, Speaking of threats, we have a question like um, from Kun. Um, which country in your opinion poses a greater security threat to the UK, China or Russia? <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult one. I mean, I think, I mean, directly, of course, Russia is very clearly the number one security threat. And we see that every day there are 
yeah sort of in efforts to have incursions either online or even planes and ships and submarines so this is this is you see an active threat um and um uh, quite worrying trends approaching i think a very sort of tough situation there down the road of course i mean uh, china is i think very far away from the UK, but the UK is becoming more involved in the region. China is also coming to us uh, in terms of um, now has the largest, world's largest navy. You've got a port in Djibouti. Uh, yeah. And so uh, it's got a, a very close relationship to Russia. It's got a perhaps a strategic alliance yet, but nonetheless, it's got the cooperation on the security side and others going ahead. So, I mean, I think it's. We're starting to see a shift there. I mean, it's going to be interesting, I think, looking ahead, whether Russia continues to be the main threat as China rises, because Russian Chinese relations may also evolve if China becomes more powerful. Russia is has to make a strategic choice mm -hmm. there. Um, so I think it's, I mean, I, I would see that's where we are. I mean, the, the trajectory seems quite clear. Um, the UK hasn't yet clarified what its security posture is towards China. I mean, we're caught in this, I think, cooperation and competition and threat yeah. uh, dynamic. Uh, does the AUKUS deal mean that the UK is engaged in a deterrence relationship in the Indo-Pacific with China? I'd say not at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, if, if there is a major conflict in the region, it now makes it that much harder to, for the UK not to become part of it. Yeah. So there is you know, a stepping into that space. And yeah. Still, it's not you know, Article 5 NATO's type of relationship around these issues, but there is a hardening of those security relationships. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question in the chat from Joanna about, well, I think it's relevant to anyone who is uh, seeking a career with mm -hmm. that. Um, she's asking, how important is the academic background? How much would you value someone with a PhD compared to someone who spent that time working in NGOs, international organizations or private mm. companies? I think it's, I mean, I think we have to look at the individual. I mean, that's normally the way we do it at Brucey is mm. uh, a PhD can be very helpful. It can also mean that the person has a very academic track and I mean, they're sort of that's more they're focused on. So it's, uh, I think you have to go through the interview process and make sure that, that is the right uh, person or qualifications, academic qualifications are a very good guy. Still, I think it's the main guide point for us. Um, but it's not an automatic qualification, I would say. I mean, some, some people are, are even suggesting, I think this is going a little bit too far, that we do blind uh, recruiting, I, we don't look at anyone's qualifications at all, but we set them tasks okay. and just to see how people respond in a creative way to particular tasks um, and recruit on that basis because of course some of the most creative people may have actually struggled to go through university and they sure. find out for various reasons. Uh, but I think we still, I mean, I think it's still very much that we look to what the cover letter and to me, the one of the most important guys actually is often the cover letter. I mean, I begin with that. Uh, have they got a very well written and thought through cover letter that is also concise? I mean, my advice is do not go over one page in your cover letter. Absolutely. You want it in there. Is it focused on what the uh, job is about? Uh, to make sure your experience links to the job. So again, I'm sure you're very proud of having a PhD. I was with mine, but you know it has to also link into what the what's required for the position. And then, of course, the same uh, experience is going to also be very relevant here. So we're going to want people who can also bring in the perspective. I think of having perhaps worked in different environments. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll wait for a couple of minutes more to see if we have any final question from the audience. 
Um, I wanted perhaps to, to ask you, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of working in a think tank? You know, because often students, uh, they have a very vague idea of what that mm. might imply. Mm. So I was wondering if you had any suggestion, any advice about what one should expect, you mm. know, what, what surprised you about that maybe, you yeah. didn't expect something particular. I mean, I think personally the toughest one is fundraising. I think that's, I mean, that's become, it's become a, a very important aspect of what you do. So people can have very creative ideas, but to turn that into something that you can persuade people should be funded, and yeah. also to know, have the networks that you can get the idea into a funder, uh, is why I say it's so important, I think, to have experience, not just because you practically know what to do, but also you have these broader networks uh, in which you can know often where you get support for your idea. Uh, so a big part of my job uh, has become a managerial one of, of 24-7-365 fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, Rusi has actually been very successful. We've grown a lot, I mean, there's some tension around it, but it, of course, you're only as good as your last project. And so we, we have to continually be searching out funding. There is no core funding. No. So, uh, you know, and this, this, I think, is it's a very tough job for researchers because they have to, it's not just about sharing your opinions and being in workshops and writing nice things. It's this really hard graft of, of staying ahead of the agenda, thinking yeah. what is coming, how can, how can I uh, find a unique angle on that if someone's going to say, actually, we, we feel this is coming, but we need to know more about it. So it's, you don't have a lot of time to reflect. And this is perhaps the meaning and value of universities. If you want to think more deeply, uh, um, that may be the environment for you. But it's, it's of course, it's exciting because you're constantly yes. on that. Yeah. Um, but I think that, that aspect has changed a lot. Uh, yes. And it's perhaps coming to universities as well, but particularly now um, in the think tank environment. And it is so competitive. Yes. Because again, there used to be think tanks, so it's Chatham House, but now uh, NGOs do think yeah, tank work right. and consultancies do think yeah, tank work yeah. and universities do a bit of it. So yeah. even what the space and competition around ideas uh, has become much more uh, dynamic, I would say. And we'll see what happens with COVID because, of course, we had an idea also a think tank being a physical think, which we see it's our building, mm -hmm. we meet in our building. We have access to the Whitehall scene because we're there. Yeah. Now, of course, anyone can set up an yeah. online think tank and invite senior UK mm -hmm. officials to come onto Zoom calls. Uh, and so the, the opportunity there for startups, you know, perhaps in, in the think tank community. Yeah. Council for Geostrategy. Exactly. So, I mean, all this, there's all this space now for, for a new dynamism, sort I of think. Um, yeah. But again, you need to have funding for it. Uh, yeah, can I just? briefly ask about the funding issue and obviously mm. in academia we also have to not as much as you but we also have to you know raise research money mm. and funding and that does lead to that question you know um who are you writing for mm. you know that question that comes up from time to time you know i you know he who plays the pipe or calls the tune essentially you know do you you know to what extent can one escape that sense of having mm. to kind of write with that particular audience in mm. mind, or you know, i.e., the person who's bankrolling a particular project, you know, is one always writing then, you know, with that audience or funder mm. in mind? You know, to what extent do you feel that you can be independent still, or does mm. that raise issues? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, Rusi is it's an independent think tank and it's, uh, it's governed by the Charity Commission. So yeah. I mean, there are statutory sort of requirements sure. around that. And so also there's, there's transparency processes. So we, we have a list of funders which is publicly mm -hmm. available. And we have a, uh, there's an ethics process around fundraising. So our trustees mm -hmm. have to approve new funders. And so we often do, we do quite a bit of um, you know, thinking through whether this is the right on that. Yeah. But think tanks, of course, also are not uh, 
sort of outside looking in on issues no. I mean, of course so Lucy is a it's a transatlantic British think tank so I think we reflect that broad view that of, there's many different perspectives in that and we reflect I think that so we don't there's no Rusi view on anything but of course we do I think have a, a transatlantic Pacific perspective on yeah. issues and uh, and post Brexit I would say there is a feeling that we should perhaps reflect a British perspective yeah. a more I mean, and so there may have been a bit of a shift in that yeah. often there was a European think tank view so we sort of wrote for the Europe Okay. And I think now that you see with integrated review the first step towards a, a debate about what the UK national interest is in a much right. clearer way than it has been yeah. really since perhaps the 1980s when you used to have, even you, and I've seen it in my recruitment, it's, it's become an interesting issue because we used to, to recruit security people. Yeah. But now you people also perhaps sometimes you have a British background, I'm just in the British world a bit more. Okay. Uh, and when I was uh, starting out, there were experts on British foreign policy, but they've all disappeared into the sort of European right. foreign right. policy world. So yeah. you don't really have, or often, there's often not a base, a very yeah. strong expert base yeah. on some security issues that has a UK sort of yes. outlook on it. Yeah. They don't have to be from the UK, but nonetheless sort of yeah. understands how the UK is positioned in these questions. So that mm -hmm. is going forward, of course, we're going to need more of those people. Um, the government has that. Yeah. Universities, it's not so strong when you see PhDs coming out. As people have written about you know, European police issues in the Balkans or something. Yes. But, you know, they haven't written about how the UK should uh, address the Balkans going forward. Yeah, interesting. So you may start to see some people coming your way with those more specific yeah. national PhD in it. Research proposal. I don't know. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for this very, Thank very, very me. interesting conversation. Thank you, Eleanor. And thank you all for joining us. Um, I will see you hopefully next month with our next conversation. And, and you all have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye. Thank you both.